Will loves his intro music. It's his favorite part of the show. I try to explain him. There's a whole thing that has to happen afterwards, but all the energy goes into the intro music. Uh huh. Grooving, I'm grooving. Today we are joined by the Hacksmith. This is uh, quite a pleasure. Uh, what's your actual name? Uh, James Hobson. James, thank you for uh, coming on the show today. You came on. You came at a weird time. I was mentioning this to be uh, before we started rolling. The studio is kind of in a state of disarray. Yeah. The the there's work going on. We've moved to the other end of it. Uh, Will was up all hours of the night trying to figure out how to re. <laughs> Get everything ready to go, mm. and who knows? This this uh, may go off without a hitch, or the whole thing might melt down. That's maybe that's well. maybe that's fitting. Yeah, having yeah, you as a guest my, because my ammo. I was uh, watching your channel, and it seems that uh, I mean, there's a lot of experimentation going on. There's some engineering going on. There's things can go wrong. Oh yeah, things have gone wrong. Uh. I was I, I watched a video. I did watch this video uh, with the adamantium Wolverine claws. Yeah, this is obviously amazing. It's a fun one. And I this well, I, I'm going to give a little bit of background on this one. This is a a, a type of what is it? An, an alloy? Uh, yeah, it's actually a nickel titanium alloy. Right. And uh, if you temper it in a certain way, you can actually basically program in its shape. So when you get a temperature differential, it'll actually try and return to that shape. And, and this material was called what, what was Night, nitinol. Nitinol, that's yeah. right. So it's actually used very it heavily even, it even in the. Uh, sounds badass. Yeah. Night, nitinol. So it's used in the medical industry for like uh, guide wires and braces, um, even like bone staples. So literally, the heat of the human body is actually basically like causing tension in the material. So it's trying to continue closing to hold the bone in place. It's a really fascinating material. Absolutely. And. Um, I've, I've used it before in the past, but usually it's like wire, like thin, tiny pieces. Mm. So this is the biggest piece of nitinol I've ever seen. It would, I would assume it would be expensive, this stuff? Yeah, I'd say the amount of material just for that blade is probably a few hundred dollars. Whoa. So compare that to like steel, that would be like less than a dollar of material. Crazy. So like one of the most common uh, comments we got in that video is like, oh, we should make cars out of this. And I'm like, <laughs> well, maybe a supercar, but even then, like... No. So you went to some place called Smarter Alloys yeah. in the video. and it's Just I, a local I, business in, uh, really? in Cambridge. Um, and their main, main market is the, the medical technology. So they, do, uh, they also do um, night and all drill bits for doing root canals. Oh, yes, I saw so that So it literally video. goes into the root. <laughs> it doesn't so look cool. fun, but like you, need, you need that kind of thing because you don't want to have a drill bit snap in your, right. in your tooth and whatnot. But so, the cool thing is we're actually we're doing a bigger project with them. Mm. We're going to try making a full Captain America shield out of night and all. Ooh. And the neat thing with that is it will be by far probably one of the biggest pieces of night and all ever like manufactured in like a thing you can hold, which I love because like in the Marvel Universe, it's just like, oh, we used all the vibranium in the world to make the shield. <laughs> like, right. We can't make another. It's not quite like that because it's an alloy. <laughs> like we can make more night and all, but it'll still be like the biggest piece out there. And we're going to basically have heaters built into it so you can beat stuff up with the shield. If the shield gets dented, you press a button and suddenly it just all pops back into place. So I think it'll be a really cool project. Ooh, that is cool. Because as you know, um, our first project that really took off with the channel was our Captain America Electromat shield. Mm -hmm. So it'll be cool to do a new and improved version that actually has a material that's like very science fiction-y like adamantanium, but night and all. It's crazy how you can have these materials out there that have been around People have used them, and and yet like, the general public has no awareness. Like at least when I clicked on it, like, oh, here's an alloy I've never heard of. Exactly. And and then you find some kind of uh, interesting way to utilize it to kind of put it in terms that people would find entertaining. Yeah, and it's probably the most rewarding part of the job, and the the coolest part of the job is we get to make projects that aren't necessarily commercially viable. Like, mm -hmm. no one's ever going to buy a pair of night and all Wolverine claws. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean it's not cool. It doesn't mean there's not <laughs> a learning opportunity there. Right. Inspiration and whatnot. So being able to play with some of these things that you've maybe only heard of in, like, a lab paper or something, 
and the fact that like, oh, if, if, when there's a will and there's a way, you can sometimes actually get your hands on some really cool stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, as the channel has grown and the business has grown, we've been able to spend more and more money on really unique stuff to try and capitalize on some of these ideas from fiction. Because the reality is a lot of the technology does exist. It's just not necessarily commercially viable. It's just not, it just does, maybe it doesn't serve a purpose in the way that like it does in the comic books and the movies and whatnot, but that doesn't mean it's not possible. So in the case of this uh, recent video, uh, what was the name of the company? Smarter Allies. Smarter Allies. Would they know about you and reach out to you or did you know about them reach out to, I'm wondering how this collaboration takes place. Yeah, so they actually reached out to us. Normally we'll, we reach out to companies. Um, but they basically found out that we're basically neighbors, like one city over. And they're like, is there anything you can do that would be cool with our material? And we did some thinking and we came up with like, why not self-healing Wolverine Claws? And like, let's do it. That's amazing. So, and then it just became a little partnership where uh, they provide the material and some resources in exchange for some advertising in the video. And we got a pair of self-healing Wolverine Claws. <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's always great when it kind of comes together on its own like it just makes sense yep. the different pieces and and uh, all you have to do is uh connect and then you've got this awesome piece of content that's, that's one of the best parts of doing a youtube channel is because we're putting all of our work out there and that just like increases the likelihood of the right people coming to you even and being like hey i saw this thing what if we did this and yeah, those, those are my kind of people. It's just like, let's do it. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, you put in the effort, you've been putting in the time, and then it's essentially it's this constant uh, video representation of what you're capable of. And then, as you said, momentum yep. starts to move. How long have you been doing it? Uh, I've been doing it personally full time for uh, six years this November. Mm -hmm. um, I've been on YouTube since 2006. So, wow. Yeah. My <laughs> Channels made April 20th, 2006, just Wild. a few months after it was started. So there was a period of time there where you weren't, it wasn't necessarily like a business or an enterprise. Exactly. So I was, I was in high school at the time and it was just, YouTube was literally just a convenient place to share videos. I didn't think anything beyond it. Sure. And then as the platform started to grow and things started to become viable, um, it was about in 2012 when they opened up the partner program to basically anyone who could sign I up. I was there for that. And I was just, yeah. <laughs> that's when I, I signed up. I'm like, this would be cool. And that's when I started kind of making videos. But I didn't really have much traction for the first few years. It wasn't until like 20, 2014 that I had uh, my pneumatic exoskeleton video kind of like pop off. I was just like, hey, maybe there is room for like some zany inventions on YouTube and whatnot. Maybe that's a niche that I could get into. When you had, let's take for example that video you just mentioned, If you when you have this start to take off and... Uh, get attention, capture views, and so on. Is this a thing that is calculated? Are you sending this out to uh, websites? Are you uh, are you prepared? Like, do you know that you have a hit idea? Uh, <laughs> we like to think we do right. sometimes. Okay, but you know the internet; it's a fickle, fickle thing. Sometimes you think it's the best thing ever, and then suddenly it falls flat. Mm -hmm. um, usually, we have a pretty good idea when we when we have certain project ideas where it's like, this project has never been done before. It's connected to some very well-known IP. Like, it's very big in pop culture. It's going to pop off. Mm. Doesn't always happen, but usually, like, we can, we can sometimes tell. With this one, uh, the Elysium Exoskeleton, it was from the movie Elysium with Matt Damon, um, but it was years after the movie had came, come out, so there's no, like, there's no SEO around it, no nothing. Um, what attracted people to that idea was more like, I was in my garage, I grabbed some normal supplies you can buy at the hardware store, mm. and I created this kind of exoskeleton that really only had one, one movement, like it can curl. <laughs> curl 275 pounds, um, but it's still enough to like, give you that inspiration of like, exoskeletons could be a thing. Mm. And everyone, everyone loves that idea, like Iron Man, obviously. And I think that's really why it connected with the audience and really started to like, give the channel a bit, a bit, of, a, a bit, mo bit of momentum. And I think we got up to about 70,000 subscribers from that video, roughly. And that was enough to kind of give me that um, faith that there was a market for this. And if I kept trying, like, the channel could grow. And uh, I think it was the, the next summer we did the Captain America Shield. And that did, like, a million views in a week or two. 
and suddenly the channel went from 100,000 subscribers to half a million mm. in a month flat. And suddenly it was just like, mm. whoa, we're a medium sized, like a decent sized channel now. Right. And then the brand deal started coming in and everything actually just started like popping off. And suddenly it was like, hey, this is viable. This is going to work. And that's when we started hiring people. There's something satisfying about the format where uh, it just lends itself well to a video, this idea that you're going to be making something. That, that you're, you know, you, there's going to be a payoff. Yeah. Because there's so much stuff you click on and, you know, we're even guilty of publishing it sometimes where it's kind of more specifically on YouTube. It's like, we'll figure out where we're, where we're going once we're, I mean, not your content, but there's a lot of it that's like that. Oh, definitely. So there's something very gratifying about a clear set of instructions. I'm going to try to do this thing and then actually well in many cases executing it to one extent or another and and seeing what happens and we do we we show our failures all the time too mm. which is something that people really appreciate because it's not like necessarily a polished discovery channel show where it's just like oh everything just went off with a hitch although it you does know? have a discovery it, it does have a little bit of vibe yeah. to it which <laughs> i'm not I'm, I'm not saying that in a complimentary way because yep. you know discovery's done some amazing stuff i'm sure you've heard those comparisons i mean there's like a I don't know, what is it, like a Mythbusters type yep. of vibe to the whole, even to your space. Definitely. Uh, the the So you're currently, you got some sort of a warehouse going. You've obviously got plenty of employees. I noticed as well that there's more uh, different personalities showing up on in exactly. videos and things like this. How did you navigate doing such things? Because that's that's a tough transition. Oh, yeah, definitely. Because um, like when the channel started out, it was called The Hacksmith. It wasn't actually, uh, it was only just before Christmas last year that we rebranded as Hacksmith Industries mm. on YouTube. And part of that was to try and introduce more co-hosts and other engineers. Because the reality is, especially with this kind of business, I can't do everything myself. And I'm now the bottleneck for really expanding the channel. So if we want to do more projects, I can't be the one doing all the work. Um, I can't be hosting all the videos necessarily. So if we really want to truly expand as a business, we've got to get more more co-hosts in. And that is obviously a tricky thing to do because um, we hit 10 million subscribers under the Hacksmith. Mm. And, people, and fans are of the Hacksmith, me. And it has been a bit of a challenge trying to bring in other people. And sometimes there's a bit of a backlash from the audience. It's like, mm. oh, where's, where's the Hacksmith? Oh, the Hacksmith doesn't do anything anymore. And it's just like, <laughs> personally, it's just like, uh, you guys have no idea how hard it is to run a business. I'm still working 80, 100 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, you're on, no, you're, you're on vacation now. You're, you're, uh, you're in Fiji or something. Yeah. No, it's, I think the tough part there is the part that shows up on video is the extent of which an audience interacts with you. That's yeah. it. That's what they see. They're like, oh, that was 10 minutes or 12 minutes or whatever. It's this compression. It's all the tools we use to make it feel as though uh, it's a fun experience. You're constantly trying to make it feel fast and quick and effortless and easy. It all came together easily. But uh, just pick any one video. Pick the Adam adamantium wolverine clause. How much time went into that video? Yeah, you know, that, I, mean, that was, I mean, start <laughs> to finish from planning and... It's a lot of pieces. Yeah, so depending on the project, some projects take months to do, and we post a video weekly. So that means at any given time, we have like half a dozen projects on the go, and it's a logistics nightmare trying to balance it all and maintain that weekly release schedule when you have to think you've got all these different ones. And we're not even that good at project management. Like, I don't have a Gantt chart with all our projects. We've got a Google Calendar with it's like, it's coming out this day. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure we hit that. Yeah, it's wild. It's yeah. chaos. It's uh, every, you just only like you look at the the finished product and you end up looking at something that feels put together and cohesive and relatively organized and things like this. Look at that videos every Thursday. Do you actually hold yourself? Is that yep. that is still happening every Thursday? Yeah. My goodness, that is. Uh... And then the other thing is like as as the channel's grown, we've uh, invested more and more into production quality. Mm -hmm which is great. It produces a better video in the long run, but it also takes a lot more time. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you scroll back five years, half the videos are shot on a tripod with me like doing the engineering, explaining to the camera. And because of that, we were able to also pump out a video a week back then, even though it was only me. Yeah. And now I I've got a team of almost 25 people and we're still only doing one video a week, but the videos are on such a different level. Right. That being said, we're hoping at some point to get to the point where we can have like two videos a week. Oh, careful. 
making commitments here. <laughs> <laughs> two videos a week. Maybe not to make it real videos a week, but we're we're playing around with some different ideas. We we want to potentially do some kind of like a bit of like a talk show kind of kind of uh, episode maybe yeah. on Mondays or something like that. But sure, it's all kind of up in the air still. Yeah, well, I mean, now that you're Hacksmith Industries, it's almost expected, I think, at least, that there would be different formats. Exactly. That yeah. you, you you bring in uh, different personalities, and then you also have different formats people can engage with, and maybe you have to... The tough part with that is altering expectations, because I've done different formats, and then you got to get used to the idea that yep. not every show and every input is going to have the same output. And But I've been... So I've been doing it as a job for 10 years. So you kind of see this, uh, I mean, you see a lot of movement transitions. You also have your own, you're, you're wrapped up in it. Yep. And so there's your, the, the things you want to do as well that might not be flashy. Uh, or like, yeah, ex <laughs> exactly. It might not have the same, it's hard because we're constantly getting programmed by the response to these videos. And, and when you have something that hits, you're like, well, let's go back for more of that. So you're not really certain what your motivation is. Is it just strictly that or is it also some kind of pet project that you might actually really want to do? Yeah, it's really hard with the, the feedback from the YouTube platform, the algorithm, the <laughs> performance of the last 10 videos. 10 out of 10. Oh. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> but then you dig back and you're like, Oh, I remember we had some videos that we weren't happy with last summer. And then you dig back and you're like, oh, they have millions of views now. Mm. It's like it's still paid off in the long run. Right. And that's a really hard thing to wrap your head around because you're most invested in that project or video for like a week or two after it comes out. And that's the next video. And that's the next video. Right. But then if you look back like a year ago, you see a video that you thought at the time didn't do well. And now it's got millions of views. It turned out it was evergreen content. You're just like, oh. I guess we shouldn't focus on the short term too much because right. like YouTube, every, every video on YouTube is like a residual investment. Like it's going to continue getting views. Maybe not as many views as another video, but it's it's an interesting thing to try and wrap your head around. Yeah, and, and, and then the part that always messes me up too is to even zoom out a, a, a little bit further and to try to figure out if it's possible for a video to be better, but to actually perform worse. Do you, do you see where I'm going? Yeah, no, there? no, there's, can... as, yeah, there's definitely there's there's video. Oh, there's an example right there. Um, we did a short film, Mando versus the Hacksmith. Okay. Um, so we actually we partnered with a local production company, um, and we made this really good 26 minute long like short Mandalorian esque episode, which was kind of like right field, like left field for us. Like it was just like. Normally, you get like a normal test video where you see me messing around the project, but instead, we actually we hired actors, we had wow. makeup, we had sound, wow. we had everything, and the team, everyone involved, was super proud of it. Kind of fell flat on YouTube because people don't know Hacksmith Industries as a film production company. Like Whoa. there are scenes in this that look like it came out of The Mandalorian. What? Yeah, and we did a fantastic job on it. And wow. It, Okay, good. It, it, it's crossed a million views. That's 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 usually our bar for like minimum success. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but it's been out since August twelfth, and again with the YouTube algorithm, is our fans and the channel aren't expecting something like this, mm -hmm. so they're not necessarily going to watch it. And you never really know. And like everyone who watched this, like it's got really good likes to dislikes. All the comments are like, "Oh, make a part two. And it's just like. I don't know. It costs a lot of money to do, and it doesn't really seem yeah, yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. So, but I, I think we'll continue to do stuff like this because it was a really good passion project, and it really allowed our production team, pr production team, to flex their creative skills and make something really cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a thing that I think I struggle with as well is trying to figure out what my own taste for something is, and and if and, and trying to infuse change just to feel healthy. Yep. And to be, be <laughs> like, that. <laughs> you know what I mean, it can get really repetitive. And, and then also just this, uh, it, the experience of being so overexposed to metrics and then wondering <laughs> how, like where you are in there yep. inside of those metrics, because I can imagine a time where you didn't have to stare so prominently at the view count of something or the retention or what, or, or whatever. And when people 
would have been making things. I suppose there would have been ratings somewhere in the back of their mind that at some point yeah, advertisers it's so front and forefront is, is is right there. Views and you can't not look at it. But and the, we get so desensitized to those numbers, like oh, only a hundred thousand people watched my video. Only a hundred thousand people. Can you imagine saying hi to a hundred thousand people? Perspective. <laughs> It's, it's, it's insane. It's absolutely ridiculous. I can I, I think back to when I was a youngster and and I would be trying intentionally to find obscure films to watch uh. <laughs> that weren't necessarily the hit movies of the time. And at no point was I was were they being validated in my mind strictly by their commercial success. I wouldn't say this is good or bad strictly because of this, but on YouTube. Certainly when you're doing it professionally, it seems impossible to have that point of view Yep. because there's just simply outside of a certain metric, it's very hard to continue doing the thing with the amount of time input that's necessary to continue to do it. Yeah. And what, one of our big challenges is like some projects can take days, some can take months. And ideally, the ones that take months should perform better because you've put more work in. But that's the issue with YouTube. It's, it's not always about work input equals reward output. Sometimes it is, pretty rarely. And that's a hard thing to wrap your head around. It's like, oh, well, why don't we just keep doing these low effort projects? And it's just like, well, maybe I'm not going to be very proud of the channel if all I do is these low effort projects. But then you put like tons, your heart and soul into like a big project and then it doesn't do well. And you're right. like, I spent all this time and it didn't perform well. And yeah. you're just like, ah. Then you have the management side of it too, where it's not just you that put passion into it, but it's yep. like whatever you said, twenty five people that have uh, all put a touch on it, and they're all looking at the metric the same way you are, and they're saying, "Oh, damn, you did." Yeah, and I've actually I've actually started seeing that recently. Like some of the video editors are now like looking at the metrics like I do, mm -hmm. and it's just like, "Oh no, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh no, you're yeah, gonna change welcome to my stress world." <laughs> <laughs> it's it can definitely change the mood. This episode is brought to you by ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, you know at this point, 2021, ladies and gentlemen, gotta be browsing with this VPN. Get your act together. Protect your online privacy. Any, your uh, telco, your your provider for your connection, they could be snooping around, sniffing around. They know everything about you. Oh yeah. They know what you're looking at. Definitely me. And they might even take that information and then sell it to other people. You don't need to be involved in all this. You get yourself a VPN and you get out of that cycle, that crazy cycle. You get some privacy, don't you? Mm -hmm. And the other thing you're going to get, this is, this is something I use all the time, is you're going to be able to unlock content from other places. So you might be surprised. You might log on to Netflix or something like this. You might be surprised. It's a whole different inventory and selection that exists in another country. You slap on a VPN. You change the location. Next thing you know, all kinds of new content to watch. Sometimes I'll be looking at the BBC. Nature? Yeah, sometimes I'll be looking at the BBC. Oh, okay. Secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash lulater today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S-V-P-N dot com slash Lou later. And you can get an extra three months for free. ExpressVPN dot com slash Lou later. This episode is also brought to you by Honey. Honey, uh, this you're going to install it on your browser, right? You're going to, uh, it's going to take you like two seconds and it's free. And you're going to save money doing what you already do on the internet. Mm. You're already over there shopping. It's out of control the shopping I'm doing on the internet. Mm. Uh, you, you hardly find me in a store these days. Yeah, everything's online. You're not going to find me in a store these days. I got things to do. Yeah. I just pop on a phone. I order something real quick. I pop on a, on a laptop. I go s sit in the setup over there. I order things online. Mm -hmm. And the way this is going to work, you add this to Chrome, right? You add Honey to Chrome, and it's going to automatically scan the things that you already added to your bag or to your cart and make sure that before you click buy, you didn't miss out on some savings. You can see here an example, saving $44.67. And people already know the story about yourself while well, saving money on snowboard equipment, which you might actually get to use this year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. 
Thanks to Honey, manually searching for coupon codes is a thing of the past. Honey is a free shopping tool that scours the internet for promo codes and applies the best one and finds it to your cart. Honey supports over 30,000 stores online. If you don't already have Honey, you could be straight up missing out on free savings. It's literally free and installs in a few seconds. And by getting it, you'll be doing yourself a solid and supporting this podcast. Get Honey for free at joinhoney.com slash lulater. That's joinhoney.com slash lulater. Thank you to Honey. One thing I want to talk to you about, because I I, I saw you mention it in uh, uh, that Wolverine Claw video, but then I went back through and actually watched the video, how you broke your hand. Yep. Uh, you're still recovering from this particular injury. Now, we were we were talking. Okay, so the... the, the uh, alloy that was used, night, nitinol. nitinol. Yeah, they were. They were uh, some examples of it being used in joints, and I, I was thinking, oh, this is too well tied into your actual <laughs> own. I'm, I'm, I'm sure they didn't use it in your case. I'm guessing yeah, it's probably titanium. titanium yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is what they would use more typically. Uh, but it's kind of it's kind of a nice tie-in with like a real life event that happened, and then inspiration, or I don't know if it's connected at all. But anyway, you broke your hand. Playing baseball. Yep. Of all things, all these crazy experiments. And- <laughs> so the extra ironic part is I broke my hand because we built a baseball cannon. Mm. But it wasn't the baseball cannon that got me. <laughs> it was an actual it pitcher. It was an actual human pitcher. <laughs> That's it's actually the owner of this club. Um, they're in Kitchener. They were fans of the channel. We just called them up and were like, oh, you want to shoot a video here? No problem. Awesome. So we head over. And the other funny thing is it's the only part of the video I'm in. The broken hand part. The broken heart. Like, I, I showed up to film for half an hour that day, and of that's course. when I broke my hand. Of course. Another couple hundred hours went into that video. Like, my business partner, Ian, he was the designer on this one. Um, the tall guy. Yeah, him. Um, and, yeah, I, I showed up to start the storyline because we are trying to, like, have it a bit more Discovery Channel-like. It's like, okay, well, why are we building a baseball cannon? Mm-hmm. And um, our thesis was kind of like, well... MLB players are pretty, like, superhuman. Like, can you imagine throwing a 90-mile-per-hour ball? It's insane, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. So part of this was going there to see, what what is that like? Mm-hmm. And the answer is, it's scary. Absolutely. <laughs> it's freaking, the ball, it's just gone. Like, they're only 60, and there's the break. <laughs> like, the pitcher's 60 feet away. Yeah. And uh, it, he did throw a bit inside, <laughs> I might have been standing close to the line. It's hard to say. Either way, I don't have the... Your foot uh, is on the line, but... Yeah. Um, I didn't have the reflexes, at like because it's yeah. like 150 milliseconds. That's all the time you have to I react. Know, and it's, it's not... Insane. You watch it on TV, and it's not a ton of... Uh, my kids both play baseball. I coach okay. baseball. So that, that's why uh, this kind of spoke to me here, because even them... Uh, they're already throwing 50 plus yep. and uh, my my younger son is at 44 feet and so they adjust the distance that they're oh. pitching from as they get uh, they, they, you know kind of relative to their strength so that the reaction time is somewhat similar and of course if you move the pitcher closer they don't need to throw it as hard for you to have similar reaction times if you were at MLB distance yeah. but throwing even faster so when you watch like Little League for example at least they used to do this in the past, the pitcher might only be throwing somewhere in the 60s, but then they would list the MLB equivalent given the potential reaction time oh, interesting. of the batter having to adjust for the closer pitching distance. Uh, Little League is 46 feet, whatever they end up deciding upon to try to uh, mimic this the scenario of big league pitching. But 90 miles an hour is, I mean, really the hitting is more to do with your vision like seeing the ball and then and knowing to time it it's your uh at that speed you know your uh decision to swing is so early right there's very i mean you yeah it's literally just like uh, swing there yeah exactly (laughs) i've I've also never played baseball (laughs) right you're kind of just guessing at that point like it's it's you're you're trying to time it up and i i would have recommended uh maybe a pitching machine it would (laughs) have I mean, this was obviously more fun, but if 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 uh, you were uh, a baseball player in this case, chances are you would have seen that ball as inside right away and, yep. and backed off. But since you were just trying to time it up, it it clipped you right in a terrible spot. Terrible, but like I'm glad it was that edge of the hand because anything like if it was more at the top of the hand, like that's more your critical like grip strength and whatnot. So 
out of all like the bones, like it's the fifth metacarpal that broke. Mm -hmm. If it broke these ones, my hand could have been like really screwed up. So uh, wh where you're at now, so you had surgery on it. Yep. And how long ago was that? Surgery was second week of June. Okay. Yeah, so it's been quite a few months. These um, type of injuries, man. Yeah. That's um, wild. There's, there's not too much pain now. It's just there's not so much flexibility. And I think part of that is just from it was in the cast for so long. Yeah. Um, like the tendons kind of lost some of their you're, stretch. Are, you're going to get back to 100, though? I hope so. That's incredible. I really hope so. <laughs> and I saw I saw you even uh, interviewed the the surgeon. Yeah. And the surgeon is also a YouTuber. This is that out of control. <laughs> As it's the reason I even got the surgery. So the local hospital didn't even want to do surgery for me either because they're were, they were too too busy and whatnot. Um, it was actually what, what killed me is the, the doctor in the emergency room was like, oh, we, we'd normally recommend surgery like if you're a pro athlete. And I was just like, <laughs> do we still live in the day and age where like pro athletes are the... The be all and end all. Like even, everyone uses their hands. And you know? there's not even that many pro athletes. It's like yeah. how many pro athletes are you seeing in this hospital? <laughs> and then the other thing was like, um, it's like usually you have surgery for anything over a 15 degree break, and mine was a 30 degree break. I'm like, well, I'm no doctor. <laughs> Sounds like I need surgery. <laughs> and um, what ended up happening was I, I obviously. I shared it on Instagram and whatnot, and one of my friends, Just Dustin, he's not a YouTuber up in Ottawa, reaches out and he's like, hey, my friend's dad, I, he's basically my dad, I grew up with him, like his kid, because they're, they're friends. Um, just reach out and like, if you need a second opinion, he'll, uh, he's a great guy. So uh, I, I DM this guy on Instagram, Dr. Chris Rayner, and he replies to me like, mid-morning, like I know he's at the hospital, <laughs> he's replying to me on Instagram. <laughs> And he, he like, I send him the x-ray and he's just like, yeah, that needs surgery. And then it's kind of an offhand comment. He's like, I could fix it for you, but you'd have to drive up to Ottawa. And I'm like, when can I come? Wow. Because that was, that was the most concrete answer I had gotten from anyone about, like, actually getting me in to fix me. Right. So I drove up to Ottawa that weekend, did a COVID test on Friday, and I had the surgery Monday afternoon. And, uh... What a cool story. Yeah. This is in line with that idea that you just start doing things. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? The same way in which your other video came together is the way in which your surgery came together, which was somebody heard about this and someone knew you from that. And then next thing you know, you're in Ottawa. Uh, I love it. It's great. I, yeah. I don't know that that service would be available to anybody. <laughs> you got, you got well, part of the, part of the reason he, he told me is just like, <laughs> Um, because his, he's got two sons. They both did YouTube. Mm -hmm. um, um, one of them was very successful. He, like, he's been in L.A., more of a typical like uh, vlog style. Wait a typical second. Typical YouTuber. Who is this? Um, shoot, what's his name? Uh, I don't, I've, okay, it doesn't, it's not, I'm just curious. I hadn't heard of him before. But, it, it, whatever, it's all yeah. coming together. Any, anyways, um, and part of the reason the doctor wanted to help me was because he knew that YouTubers take a lot of shit for being YouTubers. Oh. Like, oh, did you break your hand filming a video? Wow. And it's just like automatically the assumption is, oh, you were doing a jackass stunt, not, whoa. Yeah. So he's just like, and because he's a YouTuber too, he's like, we're family. Like, you <laughs> we're, part, we're, we're in this together and whatnot. You experienced <laughs> YouTuber sympathy. Yeah. I don't. That's uncommon. And then the the cool thing was like we we didn't plan to do a video whatsoever. Like he he genuinely helped me out of the the good of his heart. And then mm -hmm. when I came back up for um to have the cast removed and the stitches removed, um I was like, can we film a quick twenty minute interview? I think it would be cool for the for the vlog for the, for the channel. And I think that's really cool because not many people get to talk to their doctor mm -hmm. after something. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting actually hearing how he did the surgery. And all that. And the cool thing was this video ended up helping out his channel. He went from 70,000 subscribers to 130,000 subscribers thanks to this one video. So I, it was nice to be able to like, um, it's cool. help, get him, help get him in front of some more eyeballs. Oh, absolutely. He, he has awesome content. Like I don't even know how. He does a video a week. And he works full time as a surgeon. Right. Like 60 plus hours a week. And he edits his videos. Like it's, it's insane. I think it's kind of a cool development this uh the doctor youtube thing like the or 
m more, I guess, uh, transparency in an area. I mean, like you said, who, who even gets to talk to their doc? Who gets to know yeah. about this stuff? It's, it can be a really uh, isolating thing. You have this ailment. I mean, in your case, it's an injury, and uh, you have this singular opinion. You go to this place, and they're just like, yeah, now nah, we're good. You're going to – we'll yeah. see what happens. And that's a, that's a brutal – that's a terrifying thing in that moment. And then – but as more – uh, I, I don't know, I guess what you, what you would call it, traditional professionals, as they get into, get into and onto social media, realize these are people. Yeah, there's a big market for this. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a, it's interesting. We all encounter these people. Uh, there's other ones that have taken off recently, like legal, yep. legal oh, yeah, advice definitely. or financial, financial advice type things. You're seeing a next level of maturity on YouTube where the audiences have grown up on here and now need all those adult things or ad adult inputs. But it is cool to see, uh, you know, individuals' personalities that fit and they're kind of filling that role and helping people out. Yeah, that's that's an awesome story. So you'll be back. You'll you'll be back to full strength. You'll be uh, back to putting Wolverine claws on both hands. Yep. Because in the latest one, you could only and and aggressively still, you were striking aggressively with your right hand, which was your good hand, <laughs> and not yeah. were not concerned about uh, possibly all, all getting damaged. All things considered, like there's been other times where I should have broken my hand in a video, <laughs> right? And then this base. Oh, I forgot the most ironic part about the baseball cannon. It can't break a hand. Why is that? So the baseball cannon. When uh, when my business partner Ian was developing it. He found that it's easier to make it shoot training baseballs, so the squishier. Kind. Uh, okay. Um, he was able to get up to like seventy-five miles per hour. Mm. The goal was to crack a hundred. Right. It turned out to be a bigger engineering challenge than we Absolutely. thought. Absolutely. But uh, three days after I broke my hand, we're filming the final test video where he goes up to swing against his creation, and sure enough, on one of the swings, it hits him in the hand, almost the exact same spot. Just bounces off. Just bounces off. Not even a bruise. I'm just like. You gotta be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, I guess I guess the facility you were at, they could have been throwing training ba baseballs. That's the board. other thing that kills me. Like, if we had a bit more uh, foresight, we could have been like, you know what? This is a video. No one can tell if it's actually ninety miles no. per hour. It could be a softball, which yeah. um, maybe you can't. I'm not too sure if you can throw a softball ninety just because it's lighter. I. You, oh, you mean like a. Uh, Softball is like the big. Sorry, not a softball. A soft, uh, squishy, like MLB a tea, a ball or a tee ball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but either way, like no one would have been able to tell in the video. Like we didn't gain anything in the video from using your real hard baseballs, other than breaking my you hand. You could have had him throw <laughs> ninety right and on camera and yeah. been like, "Look, this guy throws power," and then just have him switch balls when he's pitching to you guys. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, hey, man, that's part of the thing, isn't it? It's, it's part, part of, of the story. Now, it's so. part of the story, <laughs> and it's also part of the uh, YouTube experience. All the different YouTubers, social media people I've talked to, it's like this willingness to get out there and experiment. This yeah. like willingness to look at you. You never hit a ball in your life, and you're like, let me start with 90 miles an hour. That was the, that was the other thing that was like <laughs> probably pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> we we should have like warmed up a little bit, you know. Soft toss, just like feel it coming maybe, in. Maybe uh, taught us the basics. Sure. Really, it was like come up to plate. And I'm like, okay, and that was about it. There was no like coaching or training of like, okay, That's make sure you do this. I'm just like, <laughs> yeah. In retrospect, that it all becomes clear. Yeah. The what what kind of protocol would have been uh, useful, but it does. It, it's kind of a cool. Uh, it's also like a, uh, like I was saying, it's an indication of how we all at one point approach these projects of getting onto YouTube is uh, m maybe even against our better judgment that we were just pouring all this energy into this platform yep. early days, not necessarily knowing what what it was going to mean or if it was going to be worthwhile. I mean, it, I'm sure if you've been doing it as long as you have, people have uh, been skeptical at different points in time, probably yep. maybe even maybe in your personal life. Did anybody... Yeah, when I quit my job to do YouTube full time, people were like, hey, "What?" Because I had, I literally just uh, bought a house with a big garage, so I had a mortgage. And I was just like, "All right, see you guys." I was just like, "Okay." That's a that's a big deal. Yeah, and I I had I calculated it out. I had like maybe six months of savings. Mm. I was just like, I got six months to make it, or I'm gonna have to go find another. So where job. did that confidence come from? 
Um, mostly from that one, the Elysium Exoskeleton video, where it's just like, okay, if I make something unique and cool, it should have some um, traction on YouTube. Hmm. And we were really hoping that was the case. And because that's not a tremendous amount of evidence. That's just a one time no, 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 deal. Not really. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we we really lucked out with the Captain America electromagnetic shield taking off the way it do did. Mm -hmm. And we did actually time that. Um, I think we timed it for when Civil War came out. So it was a big Marvel movie in right, the theaters, yeah. and I think that helped a lot of the the SEO at the time, and it really took off and grew the channel. But like, if that video didn't happen, I don't know if I'd be sitting here today. But you you also like you're what you you had a real professional job. What were you doing prior to YouTube? Uh, I was a product developer at Christie Digital. Christy Digital. Um, they're one of the biggest projector manufacturers in the world. Mm. Um, um, almost fifty percent of theaters worldwide use Christie projectors, like Cineplex. And so, all so see, Christie that's projectors. a cool. That's a real job. Yeah, yeah. that's a cool, <laughs> real job as well. Yeah. And I, I, I so what area of expertise? Like that's engineering, I guess. Yeah. So I, I studied mechanical systems engineering at Constable College. I graduated in twenty twelve. I worked in Toronto for a year and a half at a company designing injection molding machines, and then I moved back to Kitchener where I started working for Christie Digital. And it was a really, it was a fantastic job. They had a huge rapid prototyping department. Mm. And if you were a hands-on engineer, which I obviously am, you can really get like down and dirty in the process. So I was, I was going down the machine shop every day, like having my parts made, testing things out. That's and cool. it was a, it was a really cool job. Um, but I had to make the choice at some point of, am I going to keep burning the candle at both ends, trying to do YouTube at night and this job during the day? And I actually, I tried asking them if I could work part time, mm. and the funny thing was, my manager said, "Yep." The uh, director of engineering said, "No problem." Senior director of engineering, yeah, we don't want to lose Hobson. Mm. It's the VP of engineering in the HR department. They're like, "Whoa, we can't make an exception for one employee, mm. even if he can accomplish the work that he needs to in less yeah. time." Even if he's a YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And basically, I'm actually, I'm really glad that that is what happened because there's a chance that if they said yes, I still would have been technically burning the candle at both ends because mm -hmm. I'd have like half my day focused on that thing, half the day on YouTube. But instead, it gave me kind of the, the kick in the butt to be like, all or nothing. So right. I, I handed in my resignation letter the next week. So and... you think <laughs> you think the all or nothing component was like a driving force? I think so. Just no, you can't fail. Like I got no <laughs> other plan type of thing. No, I, I mean, I had a similar, I've had a similar experience myself. I've talked to others that have had a similar experience. It is like a uh, healthy amount of mo motivation or push or threat of complete <laughs> and utter failure. I think it's a, it's, it's a big what if. Hmm. So what if I do do this and what if I don't? Mm. And the nice thing for me was because I'm a, uh, trained as an engineer, I know I can probably go out there and get another decent paying job right. very, fairly easily. Right. So there wasn't much fear of like, okay, if I go down this YouTube path, there's no coming back. Right. If I go down this YouTube path and I fail, I can get a job. Again, so you're not necessarily offering advice to people on how to approach things. You're you're saying you did have a backup. I would say it's important to have some kind of backup, mm -hmm. like some kind of contingency plan. Mm -hmm. um, nothing's guaranteed, obviously, but it, the other issue is like, if I had gone down this path and YouTube didn't work out, I would have been pretty depressed as shit, Ooh. crawling back to a job. Wow. So that's the other thing you got to think about is just like. How much do you want this? What like what do you what do you want to do in your life? Right. And that comes back to the what if question. Like, well, what if I didn't even try YouTube and I'm still working as an engineer? Yeah. The tough thing about these stories, it's it's uh, inherently motivational. It's like <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like you yeah. put your head down, you did the thing, everything says, well, 25 employees. You told me before we start rolling, uh, and I don't know if you're cool to talk about it, but you're expanding as well, right? Yeah. Are you going into detail on that, or are you keeping uh, that a secret? I will on this. We're, we're not announcing on the channel because, oh, okay. obviously, as soon as you say something on the internet, it's like, okay, so why haven't you done it yet? Right. <laughs> so we, we've bought an 18-acre property. It's got a 15,000-square-foot building on it right now, and we're, we're finalizing the building plans to add a 30,000-square-foot expansion with a mezzanine. So we'll have about 50,000 square feet overall. Awesome. And uh, we're calling it HERC. H-E-R-C, 
hmm. Axsmith Engineering Research Campus. Look at that. So imagine the Avengers Campus. Right. But better. <laughs> and and real. And real. And the thing that exists. Yeah, and um, it's more of the long-term play because this building's not going to get built for another year, year and a half with planning and whatnot. So that's why I don't want to announce it on the main channel. No, I'm just fair. like... Because they'll be like, oh, why haven't you moved yet? It's like, mm -hmm. well, real life actually takes a while, guys. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like building permits and like oh, throwing gosh, up structures. Don't get me started. Don't <laughs> yeah. get me started. Um, but I'm, I'm super excited for it because part of the goal of creating that facility, because right now we, we rent, which is fine, but it's annoying when you don't own the place. Mm -hmm. Especially for YouTube. It's like, oh, you want to blow out a wall just to like film this one scene? Yeah. We can do that if you own the place. You Landlord's can't. not going to be super into that, that exactly. idea. Exactly. And the, the goal for Herc is to really turn it into the ultimate like engineering R&D skunk works mm. and kind of hopefully turn it into a mecca for inventors, creators, and YouTubers around the world to come collaborate and work on crazy projects. Because if we have all the equipment, all the tools, all the technologies under one house and all the capabilities to build almost anything, mm. think about the possibilities that that can like. Could you, could you, could you, would you think about some sort of a program that kids could take or yep. some so, sort of... So part of it, we, we've got a whole bunch of different ideas and we don't know which one we're going to do. But um, one idea is like um, the Hacksmith internship program, uh, summer camps, like you said, would be really cool to do. And almost imagine like um, artist in residence programs. Mm. What about like invention in residence? So you can come stay on the property and you can like spend a few months working on your idea and it can kind of be like, it could be like a, a scholarship or a grant style program. It could be like a competition to get in or it could, like there's tons of possibilities. Yeah. And or we don't know e why. Or even some sort of an incubator. Exactly. That's, we've thought of that too. Yeah. The, because the beauty could with actually it, launch as, could people make real products? Yeah. They could, right? Because uh, that's, that's another neat thing because we're from Kitchener and I'm not sure you know this, but Kitchener has the second most startups per capita just behind San Francisco. Right, yeah, it all Blackberry days and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah I hung so around universities. There's tons, you tons of incubators of yeah. around and whatnot. And one of the issues with being a hardware startup is actually making your product for the first time, mm -hmm. navigating all that. When sometimes all you need is to, if you whip out that prototype, now you can take it for VC funding and you can do this and that. But if you're um, a student who um, doesn't have any experience in that, it, it could take you years to make that prototype. Mm -hmm. whereas we come in and we're used to like whipping out projects in a matter of weeks and being able to get a bare, uh, like a minimal viable product produced. Minimal viable product. That MVP. Is, <laughs> I, I, is that, a, by the way, is that like a term that that's I a should know? Yeah, that's, okay. a, that's an engineering okay, term for prototypes. Thing. Okay. It's, that's really cool. But it's also a perfect definition of YouTube projects. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you just, it, it's fun to have the opportunity variety to make a lot of things. Definitely. It's all of our, like we, we've had over a dozen engineering co-op students over the years and everyone loves their job at Hacksmith because most of the times when you're an engineering student and you go off to a company, you end up doing some boring work that no one else mm. wants to do. That's just, that's just the reality of engineering typically. Right. <laughs> but you come to a company like Hacksmith Industries and we are an R&D funhouse. Right. Like, the funnest part of engineering is the first 10%. Mm -hmm. The prototyping. You know the part that's not fun? The remaining 90% where you have to figure out, like, reliability, mm -hmm. service, warranties, customers, aftercare support, selling them, producing them, being able to uh, get the price down enough so you can actually sell it for a price people will pay. All that stuff is like the hardest part of like being an engineering company, but we get to do the fun part, which is just the the R and D, um, because we're not selling the projects. We don't have to make sure it's absolutely perfect. But I do. So, but I wonder if, and I mean, you're you got a lot of you got a lot ahead of you, right? You got a lot of time ahead of you to do do a bunch of different projects and things. I wonder if ever you would become interested in making a thing. Oh yeah. And fine tuning it to the point where it could meet that next criteria of not just MVP, but like a real, because that's, there's kind of an art to that. No, I mean, I oh, understand definitely. it's hard. It's, yeah. it's a harder part, but like my channel, my main channel, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly looking at products that 
it amazes you how um, advanced they are. It amazes you how uh, well figured out these companies have mass production and quality control and nothing, barely anything breaks anymore. And almost everything's good now. I, I remember a time as a youngster where you could really make a bad, but you can still make a bad purchase, right? There's still Kickstarter projects and things that end yep. up uh, sucking. But for the most part, manufacturing and, and things like this, it's it's all pretty well figured out. And and I get curious if, and I don't know if, if there's, any, maybe you're part way on something like this, but are there products? Will you ever, would you ever engineer your own products and sell them and make them available to people? Definitely. So <laughs> that's the end. Yeah, that's definitely. the answer. <laughs> uh, definitely. Um, basically, like most of our projects aren't commercially viable, which is why they're fun, because it's like, well, this is going to be the only one in the world kind of thing. Um, and it serves a bigger purpose. It inspires other people like um, a lot of our, our videos inspire people to look into engineering and science and technology fields and whatnot, because it's like, oh, it's actually cool to be an engineer. You fun. Can can make these things. Yeah. But um, on a personal scale, I feel like if we actually invent something and have a real tangible product, mm -hmm. like, again, it's it's that numbers thing. It's like, yeah, we've got millions of people watching our videos. And it's like, okay, it's cool. <laughs> but when you have an actual product out there that you can see on the shelves that people actually enjoy or love, mm. I feel like that is even more, um, what's the word? Um, Tangible? Uh, tangible. Um, Valuable. It, it's something you can be really, really proud of. Like, I made that. Yeah. You know? It's when, when a person makes, it, it, it makes an actual investment in you with money. Like, yeah. they, they trust you. They, 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 that's a different, what is the view metric? How much do they really, I mean, there's, you have videos with 4 million views you are proud of. There's videos you wouldn't have been proud of to, to make that have 40 million views. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? The view metric is a weird one. Yep. But if somebody goes out of their way, orders something from a website, uh, it's a different level of enthusiasm. And, and even beyond just like purchasing, I'm talking about like truly loving a product. Even so, for better. example, are you familiar with One Wheels? Absolutely. I love One Wheels. Like, I think they're the best thing ever. And I feel like if I had invented the one wheel, I would die happy because I'm just like, I made something <laughs> that has affected tens of thousands of people's Kay, lives. Can I just, just uh, hate to sidetrack here, but there's a few of these out there, right? Not really. That's the beauty with one wheel. There are copycats, but, it's, but they all suck. Okay, now, so you got to get the actual... Okay, and then, and then my next question <laughs> is, the transportation thing just... Because I was... I was imagining the other one because I've been sent some of these. Never the, the real one wheel, but that one in motion, the taller wheel. Yeah. So that's the interesting thing. So that's a EUC, electric unicycle. And the weird thing is there's a million brands making those. Right. There is not one main brand besides maybe Segway that has any brand recognition whatsoever. But when it comes to the one wheel, they're the be all, the end all, the Harley Davidson. And not... <laughs> Even beyond Harley Davidson, because there are other motorcycle companies besides Harley Davidson. But people love One Wheels so much. There's so much brand loyalty there. It's such a fantastic product. Wow, I'm really this <laughs> this this uh, product segment is uh, something I'm. It came out of nowhere, right? It's a fascinating segment. Yes, and it can. And then and then and then overnight, there were so many different ways to move yourself around that was was not a car or a bike. Yep. It, it happened because because I was getting everything sent to me. I remember when you had the people were calling them hoverboards. It was yep. it was and, and they weren't. That, really, was a, that was a rough start. Like it really, was it was the first, but it, it just sucked. But everybody had them. They yeah. just came out of nowhere. And it was like you want a hoverboard. I'm like you're well, you're selling me a like they were everywhere. People, dude would pop the trunk on a truck. He'd be like, I got some hoverboards over here. He'd be like, Where are these coming from? Uh, and then you had Segway, obviously, as you mentioned. We've had this place is pretty big, so we use the um, scooters. Yeah, what's the what's the model we have? It's a Xiaomi model, right? Mm -hmm. oh, okay, a nine bot, yep. there, whatever. So we have a, we've had our variety of uh, electric transportation 
uh, show up around. And now, now actually a lot more electric bicycles, it yeah. seems to be one of the ways that it, it's going. But you feel that the one, oh, and then I should also mention one of the most popular and successful ones, just electric skateboards, yep. boosted, and then they fail. Yeah. They go under. And it seemed like nothing could stop them. It seemed like everybody wanted one of those. So uh, let me ask you. Why are you so committed to the one wheel over everything else? What is so great about the one wheel? So I have tried a bunch of other ones, such as electric skateboards and whatnot. But the best way I can describe it is the one wheel, similar to the hoverboard, is intuitive. But it's intuitive on a much better scale. It's like snowboarding on land. On mm. land and uphill. The thing I don't like about electric skateboards is you have throttle control. I don't like the idea of standing on something and pulling a trigger, and that's how I'm controlling my speed. With the one wheel, it's all leaning. You lean a bit more forwards, you go faster. You lean back, you brake. And it's just such a natural, floaty feeling. Like, literally, their, their, uh, their tagline is, float on. And that literally describes how uh, using a one wheel feels. It, it feels like you're floating along the road. And it's such a freeing feeling that you just feel, I don't know, like a sense of freedom in motion. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah. It's I've, a great promo. Look at their <laughs> website. Wow. Will's showing off the website. They, I mean, the guy's on the beach. They're, are you doing the off-roading as well? Oh, yeah. You, you can take them down mountain biking courses. Like, I've, I've gone down double black diamond mountain biking courses on a one-wheel. But you broke your hand playing baseball. But I broke my hand playing baseball. <laughs> uh, and the cool thing is, this has only just started happening in the last year or so, but, like, people are starting to, like, do tricks. Mm. And, like, it's kind of like the beginning of skateboarding where it's just like, what can we do? What, what's different? What's, what's something neat you can do? And people are, like, practicing and practicing and trying and, and doing these really cool things. And it's just, like, it's exciting to see because it's just, like, it's emerging almost as this new, like, form of transportation and sure. even sport like they have the 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 race for the rails competition every year and now it's it's gaining popularity and it's getting bigger and bigger every year and it's just such a yeah um such a cool whoa experience okay so there's only there's only one problem here these are expensive that is the big that's that's always that's, that's the big butt with these it's uh, it's not the price of a skateboard nope um, but they are such a quality product, and after after most people I've let try one end up buying one. Whoa! And we should tell people the price right now. They're wondering. <laughs> so the the XR is eighteen hundred US. So in Canada, you're up to almost three thousand dollars after duties and taxes, and that's that's pretty damn expensive. Uh, yeah, you can get a small used car, but. Uh, <laughs> It, yeah. wouldn't, it wouldn't be a great one, but it'll get you from A to B, that's for sure. Yeah. And you can put groceries in it. <laughs> it depends where you are, too. I, I've, got a, I've got a friend who, who bought one after uh, learning about them from me, and he lives downtown Toronto. And it's so much faster than anything else in Toronto. Right. You can't drive anywhere in Toronto because rush hour, subway and buses and the TTC. Hop on a one wheel, you can beat all those. Right. Like, no problem. Um and 12, then, okay, so the range I just saw twelve to eighteen miles. Yeah, on a charge. So that's about thirty-five kilometers. That's great. Which is pretty good. Yeah, that's fine. I've actually I've got a modified one wheel XR. Mm. We put a bigger battery in it. And it can do about sixty kilometers. Whoa! And at, at those, <laughs> your feet get pretty tired after three hours of riding. I see. But uh, so yeah, you, you find like, the limit. It, the limit then becomes your own body instead of the battery capacity. It must have got heavier when you did that too, right? Uh, not by too much. It was oh. honestly just like a few extra cells. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's a nice project. So the, in this case, when you do a video like that, at any point, does One Wheel reach out to you? Are you communicating with them at all? Yeah. So One Wheel has actually given me a few oh, free okay. One Wheels over okay. the years. But okay, I've this also... explains everything that we're hearing. <laughs> I, I have personally bought like, <laughs> I don't know, five or six at Whoa. least. I've, I've bought them as gifts for people because I know how like life-changing they are mm -hmm. like honestly I, the amount of people i've talked to about like um like me mental health being able to like experience it's kind of i wouldn't say it's an out-of-body experience but like the, the the freedom you feel on a one wheel 
floating around Whoa. can do wonders. This and this this sales pitch just hit a whole new <laughs> level. Yeah. I'm in. I want to get one. <laughs> I've got say, one in my trunk right say, now. Actually. Say goodbye to your antidepressants. <laughs> And I'm serious though, like it, it's incredible how like wow. freeing it feels, and it's just like it's a change of Would you, it's a change of everything. It's a change of scenery, like gets you outdoors, gets you outdoors, you know, kind of fresh more engaged air, with the environment, yeah. being in a car or something. Uh, are you listening to music while you're doing this, or no? Definitely. Okay, yeah, you I are. love grooving to music, right? Um, because again, with that that floaty feeling of just like it's almost like dancing, mm. you know, like you can be like carving to the music to the beat and stuff. Sure. And it's just, it's, it's wow. very fun. It's a whole uh, meditation thing you have going on with this. Yeah. Will, <laughs> go ahead, fill up the cart. We'll take six. <laughs> this is the one experience that I'm lacking. I don't, I think it's like the one uh, uh, that I have never tried out of the variety of, of different yeah. electric transportation. They, we've seen so many, but not mm -hmm. this, the one we um, never showed up. Yeah, that's, that's the neat thing because, like I said, there aren't really any clones. There's a few like really cheap ones from China that look the same, like it's a wheel in the middle, sure. it's a board, but it just it doesn't work. And whether that's just a testament to one wheel's engineering that they've like, because like the motor control is the most important part for a device like this. Like you have one wheel. That one wheel has to do everything. It has to account for the way you're leaning, balance, and I think there's some really good secret sauce in there in the speed control sure. of how this thing works that might be part of the reason why another company hasn't been able to just simply copy it. Tough whereas, to rip it off, yeah. Whereas the the electric unicycle, I just picked one up actually because I was curious. I'm like, okay, I got to see if like, maybe these are really good too. Yeah. And they are pretty fun. Uh, definitely a bit harder to learn and it's completely different motion. The turning radius on that, I could never get like a tight turn. Yeah, so the one wheel you can spin in place if you want right. to. Right. Um, once you get comfortable with it, you can you can drag the edge, like you can lean all the way down and literally touch the ground with the edge of the board and like do a toe spin almost. Mm. Um, and it's, yeah. So this is your most loved product, apparently. <laughs> yep. Right? This is the <laughs> one you wish that you had invented. Obviously, it's already been invented. What is the pro What is the product you're going to invent? That's the problem. I, I really don't know. I, I would like it to be something functional. So, uh, basically, like an everyday carry, like an everyday, like something that, <laughs> to put rather lofty, to change your life. Whoa. You know? Like, I feel like one wheel has changed a lot of lives. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm not just saying that, like, well, that's honestly. The, uh, that's the optimal uh, product experience, thing, a thing that you can buy that will change your life in a positive way. I mean, every company, everybody selling anything claims that's what their thing does. Exactly. So but, imagine like, I guess, I don't know, the inventor of the one wheel listening in on this conversation be like, yeah, that's pretty gratifying. we made an awesome one wheel. Like you imagine like you, you invented a product that people can't stop talking about mm -hmm. in a positive way. Mm-hmm. That's that's success right there. That's you made something good. That's like people with Teslas. People with their Teslas. They just love yeah. them. Yeah, and the, and the and the big problem here is like that is the pinnacle of like product development and design, but not many products hit this level. No. So that makes it even harder for me to be like, oh, I want I want to be known for something really good. Do you think I don't it, I don't want to be known for something that's okay? You but know? do you think that it gets there immediately, or wouldn't? the one wheel story be similar to a lot of stories making things like were there would there have been other products along the way that could have been less lofty but then lead to discoveries like similar to experimentation we've had on youtube or approaching any challenging task yep. that you actually have to get into the groove of fully making and delivering things before oh, you have a one wheel or an iphone or a <laughs> tesla or whatever it is yeah that you it's you kind of have to Get in the game, so to speak. Exactly. And uh, we started doing that last year. Go ahead. So uh, we actually formed Hacksmith Retail, mm -hmm. which is a, sec a sec um, separate business underneath Hacksmith Industries. And it's partially a merch company, but it's also a test for our team to learn about logistics and working with manufacturers and uh, actually uh, delivering a product. Mm -hmm. And we've actually made our uh, partnered with a few manufacturers and made some some pretty cool stuff. Uh, as a test, I actually brought uh, one thing for you. Oh, cool. Wow, look at this. <laughs> An un, uh, unexpected moment. 
Whoa. A live unboxing. Look at this. We have the Mini Saber, Hacksmith Industries. Will, can they see this right now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I'm going to do a live unboxing. <laughs> this is a nice box, by the way. Yeah, I, I love nice boxes. Yep. It's a very important part of the experience. This is the first impression. Whoa. Check the photo. <laughs> Look at this. There you go. With the like red lighting, very Star Wars esque. Harness the power of the mini saber. This is a good idea. Yep. <laughs> so this is a very aggressive looking lighter. Are we calling it a lighter? We're not calling it a lighter. It's a mini saber. It's a mini saber, <laughs> which is. So there's a, a lock, the small switch on the other side. Uh, this one here, right? Yep. So just flick that down. And now if you pull that. <laughs> Listen to this. <laughs> Why is that so satisfying? This so, is a good grip as well. Yeah. So it's the most powerful butane blowtorch I've ever found. And actually, I found that product years ago. Mm. And the issue was I saw it advertised everywhere on the internet. But it was always from either sketchy TikToks or Instagram stores. Mm. I don't know about you, but I I don't trust any stores on Instagram. Right. It's always like it's just like it's shoved down your throat, and you're like, "Am I actually gonna get this product?" Yes. So um, I managed to get some off of AliExpress, and they turned out to be just as good as the ads made them out to be. Like you can melt a, a pop can in half with that. You can literally like cut it in half. It's really cool. This is too addictive. <laughs> I can feel the heat, too. I oh, mean, yeah. It's pretty serious. So what we wanted to do was um, we wanted to see if we could actually reach out to that manufacturer and import them ourselves, mm -hmm. put a little hack and a spin on it, mini sabers, since we're known for our lightsabers, obviously. And um, it's been going great. We can't keep them. We can't keep them in stock. Like everyone like wants to buy them mm. and we're out of stock and now we're running into like logistics issues from the manufacturer to actually get enough to be able to sell them. And this is obviously Rev One. Like we didn't design it in any way. We we put our name on it and we're doing all the, the logistics of the, the warehousing and the shipping and the packaging and all that. But what we want to do in the future is design a custom one that is exclusively from Hacksmith Industries that looks even more like a mini saber, since that's what we're um, that's yeah, the whole, like you, you thing can, we're going off. Yeah, well, no, I mean, I can totally imagine. I already sort of feel that way just holding <laughs> it. It's a good find in that sense that, yeah. like, you attached a name to something that already was kind. I mean, I'm feeling that way. Was it? So this was already like this. Like what, we, we picked the colors. Oh, okay. Um, but All right. beyond so that, it's like modded it was, to a certain extent. Yeah. But it really feels like I feel good holding this. <laughs> I feel empowered holding this thing. And it has some functionality. I like this is better than merch. Yeah. <laughs> it is an elevated type of merch because it is connected to your brand, but it has some level of usefulness outside of like a T-shirt or something. It feels more, yeah. more special. So that, that, that's part of our goal with Hacksmith Retail is besides the typical merch, we want to really um, lean hard into the EDC category, everyday mm -hmm, carry, mm -hmm. because – that's starting to go in the direction that I want to go, where it's like I'm making products that people actually use, actually like, and it become like part you of their life. You should be in know? touch with uh, uh, Vince from Accessorize Me. His whole thing is EDC. He was yeah. on the show recently. He's Toronto based as well. Awesome. You should. So when you when you put these type of products out, you should send to him as well because he'll put it on his channel. And it's just that's the whole channel is EDC. Nice. Uh, he'll do all types of different guides and themes and things like that. I could imagine he could uh, integrate some of your stuff into, uh, yeah, I don't know. I just, <laughs> that connected in my mind. Yeah, I'll, right I'll, there. I'll definitely send him one. That's awesome. This is cool. Thank you so much for this. This is, uh, I'm going to use this. I'm going to go actually impress my kids with this. They are, they are fantastic for lighting, like even like having a campfire in the backyard it's so much easier with something like that than right. struggling with a regular lighter. Some it's real, like, bring yeah. some real power to and, it. And like you said, like, it is very well connected to our brand. Like, we use fire <laughs> all the time in our videos. And the neat thing is, with a bunch of these EDCs, like the goggles even, um, we use them in our videos. Mm -hmm. And now you've got, like, that continual, like, product placement showing off, like, this cool thing. So we're definitely going to continue looking into other uh, really handy, well-designed tools that we can partner with those companies and make a, a Hacksmith exclusive version and whatnot. That is so cool, man. I think you nailed it. That's a really good initial approach, but 
having uh, watched your channel and even just talking to you right now, I know that the eventual thing you have to, you actually have to design and make a the real thing. lightsaber. Well, just <laughs> the odd uh, thing. Yeah. Odd uh, thing because it's, uh, I can tell based on the way that you were talking about that one wheel that that, the there, there's is. something there. <laughs> there's something there. And then, and then, and then I've had this experience myself is YouTube is hard. And, and then you're just, you're just doing it. You're just this really one track singular focus, which is great because, um, I, I would love to get to the point where I'm not paying attention to the views or the analytics at all. Interesting. Will it ever happen? Okay. I don't know. Is this but if I get far enough with product design and having something out there and other things in the business that I can like really focus on and latch on to, like part of the other goal is Hacksmith Industries will always have a YouTube channel, but we have plans so much far beyond that. Um, I want to be a real engineering company. I want to make products eventually and have all these different things going on. So I don't ever plan on stop doing YouTube, but if I can stop stressing about youtube mm. Whew, that'd be amazing yeah because <laughs> because who even knows what that frees up mentally that uh, that extra bandwidth to go after some other thing that's a very similar um experience that i've had and other people that i've talked to it's so all-encompassing the youtube thing it's like somehow the game they've created because you can just be, it's 24 7 you can continue focusing on youtube no matter what it's a video game. It's very difficult to turn it off when you're starting to figure out how to have some level of success with it. And then you wake up and it's 10 years later and you're, you're like, oh, you know, there's all these other projects and things that I would love to do or work on. And you, but you realize that you're maxed out and you got to take from one place to deliver it somewhere else. But that's kind of the other thing that success grants you, man. You I mean you have videos here, like look at this: twenty-six million views, fourteen million views, seven million views. It, it's it's weird to feel trapped when you when success has given you so much freedom. <laughs> yep. Like you can yeah, really do the nail you, you can there. really do whatever you want, but it doesn't feel like it. And it's because those like moving around those mechanical pieces from a management perspective or putting the people in place, it's all very very difficult to relinquish any. Uh, amount of control but i can tell that obviously uh you're you're passionate about engineering to the extent that um that you that you probably will end up doing something in that in that area at some point and you're gonna have to relinquish some youtube control or at least or show up there less or yeah. dive into it less and who knows you uh, uh my, my biggest dream for the youtube channel i guess you could say is we have enough hosts and engineers that we can put out steady content and I'm still probably going to be the idea guy behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. I'll be like, oh, wouldn't it be cool if we did this? Mm -hmm. And wouldn't it be cool if we did that and this and this? And then I dream about being able to show up to work and see which of my ideas are coming to fruition. Whoa. And start playing like, oh, we built a giant, another giant mech. All right, let me take it for a spin. Like literally, it's, it's very much like, um, like Batman with um, <laughs> Morgan Freeman and his... Uh, Shit, what's it called? Uh, Fox? Yep. Uh, oh, what? You're talking about like the one floor where they're exactly. developing... Um, yeah, well, what name am I thinking? Lucius, Lu Lucius Fox. Lucius yeah. Fox. Yeah, okay, he's a character. They, they have a name for that department, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know. R&D department? Some no, sort no, of research. It's got a cool name. Wayne something. Wayne, Wayne Tech, I think. I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm proving I'm not a huge comic book nerd right now. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea of like being able to like throw out all these ideas and have them made so you can see if they stick. Mm -hmm. Like imagine being like, all right, I got like a dozen ideas. Yeah. Let's see which out of those 12 actually work. And having the resources and the capability to actually make them happen. It's a type of, uh, it's a type of editing too, like an editorial where, where you kind of have to distance yourself a little bit from each individual project in order to see it clearly. Yeah. Because you can become too connected to it where uh, you're uh, overestimating the significance of it just because of the investment you've made. Definitely. If you walk in and there's four or five different things, you're like, yes, yes, no, no. You're, you're clear-minded and you're looking at it 
uh, in a more fair way. That seems odd, but but in a, possibly in a more fair way. Yeah. Um, it would be like being a chef and having and having um, a bunch of sous chef, and they're trying to say this should get on the menu, and you come in and you taste that, and you're like, nah, this can't make it, or or this can. It's you need to have a um, a little bit of distance from each, and you can come up with the idea, and then I, I like that too. I think that's an optimal scenario. Very difficult to to create such a thing, but if anyone can do it, you can do it. You already have 25 employees, which is wild on its own. Managing all that, man, just day to day. Whoo, whoo. When you start out, you didn't imagine that. Oh. You didn't imagine <laughs> signing that many paychecks. My goodness, uh, you are your very own Wayne Enterprises at this point, <laughs> or and definitely working towards it. Thank you so much for joining on the show. Thank you for the mini saber. I told you my kids are going to get an absolute kick out of this. Well, never mind my kids, me, myself. I'm going to get, a, I'm going to continue to get a kick out of this. Hopefully we have you back at some point, by the way. Sounds great. And we'll see what that, what that product is. And I'll unbox it here on, on the channel as well. Sounds like a plan. Thanks so much. Thank you.